what are some of the comics that brought you to the medium? So I would say like maybe your like three to five things that you read as coming up <coughs> that made you want to even, you know, make these things called comic books. Anyone want to go start? first? Yeah, I can go first. Okay. Okay. Uh, I first discovered comics when I was a kid. And my uncle had a box of just like one little box of 70s era Marvel comics that was like Man Wolf and Iron Man and like <laughs> just some like random stuff. Right. And I fell in love with just like the art of it. And when I was in middle school, it was when those Marvel trading cards first came out. Mm hmm. Um, so I got into collecting those cards, but I never really was that into the stories of comics. I was really just more into the art. So I would just like, I don't remember anything about the stories. I don't remember like wh what Man Wolf's deal was. I just remember like looking at the art and trying to draw like that. Right, right, right. And then I, and then I, I think when I moved to Portland, which is like within a couple of years of meeting Dave for the first time in like the late nineties is when I first discovered. So I grew up in Sioux City, Iowa. So in Sioux City, Iowa, there's like not a lot of access to any comics that aren't just like spinner rack comics like Marvel and DC. And when I moved to Portland, Oregon, I discovered um, Black Hole by Charles Burns, yes. which was the first time I read a comic that I was like, oh, like this is a legit thing that I think like I might want to try to participate in. So I think like Black Hole, I would definitely count as like oh, one of the piece. big first formative things. And maybe like, it's like some of the Dan Close stuff that I like Ghost World, I think also is a big influence. Mm -hmm. um, like maybe Adrian Tomine, yeah, also. But like that, so like those comments are the first stuff that I did. like in like Chris Ware, um, yeah. like the early Chris Ware stuff. Mm -hmm. But like that, those are the first time I read comics that I was like, yo, this is like more than um, superhero stuff that I read from my uncle's uh, long box or whatever. Right. They ain't just for kids anymore, yeah. kid. <laughs> This is totally true. So that was like a what, uh, late night? Was it mid? Yeah, late nineties. Late nineties. Like, yeah, yeah. I yeah. always drew comics, and I always drew comic. Like I had a comic in my um, high school newspaper uh, about a superhero um, circus troupe. Oh. Uh, and the main <laughs> character was named Psycho Clown, which was way before ICP was a thing. <laughs> and I should look into you should like. Should sue them. Yeah, I totally should. Yes. <laughs> Might as well. Might as well. Yeah. They should be sued There's just, app. just on general app. principle yeah. alone. So it's like a general. suing app now. You could just go ahead and just do it. Um, so what about you, David? Um, oh man, I mean, my my love of comics and my exposure to comics goes way back to um, the early '70s. But I think the really some of the most formative stuff in the '70s, Marvel was um, publishing a black and white Planet of the Apes magazine. And uh, they were largely adaptations of the movies, the, mm -hmm. the original Planet of the Apes movies. And then there was also these articles about filmmaking. And then there was original stories in there. And, and like that was the beginning of my love, of, my true love of comics. But also like my actual study of film began at like about six or seven years old, reading articles, deep dives into film. Because I was like nerdier than any of you in this room could ever hope to be. Uh, so, so that was the beginning, and I was reading Marvel and DC stuff. Um, I mean, I, I literally learned how to read with comics. Um, and then in the mid '80s, uh, a guy named Matt Wagner started doing a book. First, he was doing a book called Grendel, uh, but then he started doing a book called Mage. And Mage was uh, started coming out while I was in high school and into my first year of college, and that really like changed everything for me because like if especially if you look at Mage you can see his progression both as an artist and a storyteller it was pretty pretty amazing and I'd, I'd gone to art school to to be a comic book creator and then um and then Kyle Baker did a book like late 80s early 90s called Why I Hate Saturn and mm -hmm. and that was the book that I, I actually stopped reading comics for nearly 10 years because I, after I read it, I said, I'm never going to be able, to, I'm never going to read a comic better than this. And I just, I didn't want to ruin the experience of reading comics. And it's now 20 something years later, and I still have not read a comic better than Why I Hate Saturn. Um, it's still, I think, the single greatest graphic novel of all time. Mm -hmm. And that's saying a lot because, I mean, like Contract with God is an amazing graphic novel, right. and Blankets is an amazing graphic novel, and Mouse, there's a lot of great stuff. But to me, Kyle broke so much ground with that book, and, and it, was, it was ahead of its time then. It's still ahead of its time. It's out of print now, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I think, it's, I think it's available digitally. I think you can on get Comixology, it. Yeah, on Comixology. Yeah, on Comixology. Mm -hmm. um, I've never even heard of it before. Oh, yeah, no, it's like, that's because that's you're young, man. You a whippersnapper, son. <laughs> Are you reading, son? like, Black Hole? And stuff? Yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing <laughs> but, with you. But, yeah. <laughs> but really, yeah, like, and the interesting thing, too, is when because when we talk about graphic novels and the things that change the game. Yeah. 
Matt Wagner is always left out of the conversation. And, I really like his work. And um, because they always talk about um, Watchmen and they always talk about Dark Knight Returns, right. which was the exact same time as Mage was going on. And the, the difference was that Mage was groundbreaking in that it wasn't taking pre-existing characters and putting a new spin on them. But then they don't talk about Kyle Baker either. They don't talk about Cowboy Wally show. They don't talk about um, 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 Why I Hate Saturn. They, no one talks about Nat Turner. Right, the Nat Turner and, piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so. yeah exactly. That, no, I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah I was, was going to say, and that reminds me of, of another book that was really formative for me, which was Kings in Disguise by uh, James Vance and Dan Burr, mm -hmm. which was put out by Kitchen Sink Press. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was like my all-time favorite graphic novel. And I think a lot about why um, Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns are always in the conversations about the best graphic novels of all time. And it's because they're they, Marvel and DC keep putting those books yeah, back they're out. They're in yeah. print. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, yeah. yeah. But there's, Better books than those books that exist Way that better. were put out by smaller publishers. Oh that no, just, that's, that's part not, of it as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The independent, you know, always gets kind of run over by. I always talk about that too, especially when we talk about like representation, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, and there, and of course, like all types of identity, you know, because representation is a type of. It, uh, I thought something else really profound. Okay. Can I just share this? You do sure. your thing, and then I'll I'll do my thing. Oh yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say that you know because because Marvel and DC are pretending to be comic book companies. They're not really yeah. comic book companies, by the way. They're IP farms. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. And they're keeping alive these these characters, right? But a lot of times they take the air out of the room when you have some really really innovative work mm -hmm. that is actually like uh, pushing I think the envelope, like Mage, for instance, yeah. or, or and Grindel actually too, or Cerebus mm -hmm. or what have you. So, but well, oh, the thing, the, the other thing about why I hate Saturn, which blew my mind, was when I got to the back of the, the one of the supporting characters was a black guy who was not like your typical black guy in comics. And so that kind of blew my mind. But then when I got to the back of the book and they had the about the author picture, I was like, yo, I think that guy's black. <laughs> and, and it's the same way a lot of you are looking at Ezra and I right now going, oh, what, what are these two guys? <laughs> um, Kyle's like that. He's, he's you know, it's that butterscotch effect where you're not quite <laughs> sure. He didn't have his dreads when he took the author right. photo. Right. You know, so, um, That's but, wild. but that also blew my mind because as it was, as it pushed me out of the um, comics world to, for a very long time, mm -hmm. it also gave me like this permission to do whatever I wanted to do. It was Kyle's work said, do not be afraid to just be yourself. Right. Right, right, right. I mean, because and, and you were talking, we were talking about this earlier, as far as like how you how how you write comics or make comics. There really aren't any set rules as far as like scripts or what have you. No. And because of the inherent sur surreality to me of like the comics medium, um, you can do just about anything because everything in a comic book is a symbol. Yeah. Right? And and to that to that uh, end, um, what is it about this particular medium? Well, well let me back that up. So I, I really think that um, I really think that storytelling. Uh, is a type of problem solving. You know, it's, to me, it's a technology for for getting through uh, particular types of issues, whether it be personal, societal, what have you. What is it about the medium of comics that you think lends itself so well to this type of, you know, uh, this type of like uh, dealing with <laughs> problem solving, like in that fashion, the tensions of of, of that as a storyteller. Hmm. Well. <laughs> Because hmm. it's a particular medium, right? You see it's what I'm doing here, Alex? Yeah. Hmm. I'm stalling for time. It just, it <laughs> well, makes I mean, me, it, makes me look like I'm smart. It up is because you're both so good at it. You're both really good at the medium. You understand it very well, right? And, and you get across a particular type of pacing, a particular type of representation. And a lot of people wrongfully say, like, oh, well, comics are like film, or comics are like this. It's like, no, comics are like comics. Yeah, they are. You know, yeah, comics, are, they, they, they behave in a particular way, mm -hmm. and, they, and they actually like, are employed in a particular way to do storytelling. What do you think about the way that they do that that is different for the type of work that you try to do? Well, for me, it's, um, a lot of it is about the, the, the participatory process of both creating a comic and then reading a comic. Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing a comic, I'm, I'm first and foremost, I'm writing it for one person. I'm writing it for my artist. I'm writing it so my artist knows what to draw. It's, it's all a suggestion. But then I'm also writing it, and then the artist mm -hmm. and myself, we're working in tandem to create it for you, the reader. And it's what are you going to bring to it? We're bringing, we're bringing like 75% to it and then you're bringing 25% to it. 
but that 25% is actually 100% mm -hmm. because you're reading it, you're studying each image, you are probably hearing the different voices of the different characters in your head, and you are most importantly, and this is the thing we, I talk about all the time with my students, you, you are understanding what's happening in between the panels. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's one thing to look at a panel and see what's going on in the panel, but it's another thing to figure out what's happened in between panel one and panel two. It's, and that's, that's the, um, part of it is the language of assumption, mm -hmm. and it's also the, 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 um, the act of participation. We're going on a journey together, and, and that's what I love about it. Now, prose does that a lot. It actually does it even more than comics do. Right. Film does it very little. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the thing I love about comics is that, is that participation. And that's, in the creative part of it is, um, that, that's sort of what drives me is knowing that, okay, I'm, I'm going to start the journey, but we're going on it together. That journey isn't complete until you come along with me mm -hmm. or come along with us, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would say, uh, that. I don't have anything as intellectual as Dave <laughs> had to say. A couple years ago, I wouldn't have had it truth. either, but now I'm a Speak teacher. Speak your so. truth, brother. But <laughs> I, I feel like I'm a pretty medium agnostic creator, and I don't think that there's anything that comics necessarily do better for me as a creator. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when I look at mediums, I look at the people who are consuming those mediums. So like, if I have a story, the idea that... I decide to make it as a, as a comic book. I'm imagining like who are the who are the type of people that read comics, yeah. and like who am I going to reach by by making this story? Mm -hmm. So I think as a creator, my ultimate goal is to. I mean, I have things I think are important enough to to say and to reach people with, right. uh, and so. Yeah, I think I just lost my train of thought, but. I'm just gonna let you. <laughs> I'm gonna participate and fill in the blanks. Yeah, maybe you can I'm fill filling in the, the blanks, blanks of exactly but, what you were about yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, and like, it so is so fascinating. It's gonna be so amazing. It is so much smarter than. But like, yeah. so I'm, I'm working on an audio drama now. So yeah. and I feel so. I think the point I was trying to make was that like I'm trying to say things that I think are important, and I'm trying to reach certain groups of people. Mm -hmm. And so like if I can, if I only make comics my entire life, I'm only gonna ever reach people that that read comic books. So I think like I definitely don't have any loyalty to comics necessarily. I feel like. I've reached some people via comics, and I'm looking forward to reaching people via other mediums in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that kind of leads to some other things I was thinking about as far as like medium and genre. Um, because again, you both have worked in various media, right? And I think have done some amazing things in both. Is there, you say you don't have a favorite, what, do you have a favorite medium? I mean, is it is a particular medium that you prefer working in? I mean, you prefer working in film? It's just like, it's about the, it's about the, the end result about what you're trying to get across. Okay. I love all mediums and I look oh, forward yeah. to it. Like I want to make video games. Like I said, I'm doing an audio drama now. I mm -hmm. hope to get into film and TV, you know, fingers crossed eventually something like that will happen, but mm -hmm. I want to do everything. Yeah. Music, Music, everything. Really? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> How about you, David? Yeah, I don't... Um, I know you're a huge I, film. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a, um, <laughs> so. I'm a storyteller right. first, first and foremost. So the right. medium becomes... I mean, one of the things I, I really want to do and, uh, and part of me... I'm just I'm I'm not gonna lie I'm I'm scared to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to take a story and I wanted to execute it in three different mediums. I wanted to do it as a pro short story, then yeah. I wanted to develop it as a comic and get somebody to draw, it, and then I wanted to do it as a film. So, I wanted to do this exercise in telling the exact same story in three different mediums because you can't tell the exact same story the exact same way in all three in three different mediums. It's just not possible. Right. And so um, I, I honestly think. Don't be surprised if in the next two to three years I do that. I have the story. I know exactly the story that I want to tell. It's, it's nonfiction. It's it's up here, mm -hmm. and I can't. But I can't figure it out for any one of those three. Any one of the whether it's film, comics, or prose. I, I just have not been able to. Um, a, I'm scared, and B, I'm lazy, and that is a deadly combination. <laughs> um, it's uh, that's it's Very like you don't even need three strikes. That's two strikes, and you're out with with lazy and scared, or I'm scared, I should say. <laughs> um, but but you know, like right now, I mean, I love there's, the thing about comics with the you know prose is is like the easiest entry point mm. because all you need is is you know um, you don't even have to know how to draw. If comics, if you want to do comics and you don't know how to draw, then you got to partner with somebody. But with with um, prose, it's just you and your imagination, your ability to write. 
Um, and and but comics is a pretty fairly easy entry point, mm -hmm. I feel. And and yeah, I have to agree. I mean, it's like it's very it's a very different space right now. Where like you know there was one particular point where if you wanted to get into comics industry, you had to like almost like move to New York. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And now it's like well, you know, you can move from being like a someone who's a fan of the medium to uh, you know writing for comics or, or drawing comics because the the access point has changed and you know the uh, the tools have become like more ubiquitous and, yep. and, and, and you can actually get them a lot more um, it's a lot more transparency <coughs> in, in, in process and things too um, that's a couple questions so one is uh, about genre because I think that um, you both have, have, a, have a particular uh, affectation for particular genres too uh, what are some of your favorite genres and why? You know, do you like working in them? And then a second part is like, how do those change the way you collaborate? Because both of you have actually done collaborative works too. Mm -hmm. And so talk about, I guess, like your your favorite genres and why, and then also talk about like the the process around um, collaborative work. So. Mm. You go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a big <clears throat> sci-fi horror nerd, um, and I, I think similar to Dave, I got into sci-fi and horror mostly through film, I think. So I was a big film geek before I was a big comic book geek. And I think for me, I like working in those mediums just because I like them. I don't think that's like there's anything more intellectual than that. I just like science fiction and horror, so I like to write stories like that. Right. I think the deeper answer is that it's it it's nostalgic for me because my dad was a big sci-fi horror I get that. nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, and also my dad was my black parent. And so I feel like sci-fi and horror to me are inextricably linked to race and my connection to race. So I think one of the reasons I try to play in those sandboxes is like a way to be closer to my dad. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I mm. think there's like, that. that's like the emotional pull that keeps drawing me back to those mm -hmm. um, genres. But I think also the thing that excites me about them intellectually is just the idea of using uh, symbols and facsimiles for things that exist in the real world to, to affect people and to provoke people from behind in a yeah. way that they don't really expect. Yeah. I think I always point to Get Out as like a recent example that everybody's seen, most people have seen, that does such a brilliant job of like getting anybody immersed in this visceral horror story and then no spoilers, but at the end when like the flashing lights appear, yeah. everybody who's watching that movie has the same thought, which is, oh <laughs> shit. Whether, you, whether you're a Blue Lives Matter person, <laughs> Black Lives Matter person, whatever, everybody has that same, same thought. And if you are a Blue Lives Matter person, you've been sucked into the story and you see those sirens and you say, oh shit, mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah. And like that to me is like the epitome of why I like to work in genre. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now what about um, the collaborative aspect? How do you, how do you go back? Oh, oh, you know what? I'll tell you what. Do the, do the genre thing. Well, he the, answered. He gave the exact answer I was going to give. So I don't need to. Yeah, no, that was. Um, <laughs> okay, see? <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, but I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm with Ezra on everything he said. Um, but I, I mean, I've been moving from genre to genre, you know. Uh, and now I'm working in. I've got one project that's superhero, yet it's superhero mystery. Mm -hmm. And I've got supernatural monster hunter yep. story. But that's actually a family drama. Yes. You know, uh, his uh, historic with historical spice, I guess, added eleven herbs and spices of history. Mm -hmm. But I'm also working in nonfiction now, which is, um, you know, incredibly challenging, incredibly daunting. But it makes me feel like that that my work might matter a little bit, and that there's a chance it'll live on beyond me, um, because I, I think about that. I think about when I'm dead. What are, what are the people going to be like, David Walker's top 10 books? Mm -hmm. And, you know, no offense, but I don't want it to be Tarzan on the Planet of the Apes. I don't want to be remembered for that. So <laughs> I'd rather them, them say, oh, he, he was the writer of The Life of Frederick Douglass than co-writer of, you know, Tarzan on the Planet of the Apes. Nice. But that's just, you know. Nice. But well, I have no control over that. Well, think about co-writing, too. Because uh, um, comics, yeah. comics is a medium that, of course, you can, if you're an auteur, a cartoonist, you can, you can do all aspects of it. But, you know, because of the, um, you know, the corporate side of things, as far as like comics, I mean, you can you can have a creative team as much as like, you know, eight people work on a book from mm -hmm. various standpoints. Um, how does, it, what, are the, what are the positive and negatives around that, you know, as far as the people who are, how many people are interested in making comics in the, or have made comics? Okay, some folk, all right. It's a few, okay. So yeah, yeah, so um, what are some of the, uh, the aspects of doing that, you know, because, not all collaborations are awesome, and some of them are wonderful. So, <laughs> you know, 
So. Well, I can talk about the auteur side, I guess, because yeah, I write yeah. <laughs> draw my own stuff mostly. Right. I, th I think the only reason I make comics is because I happen to be good at two things, which is writing and drawing stories. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, it's like the lowest bar of entry for me to tell the stories I want to tell. Mm -hmm. I actually moved uh, to Portland, Oregon, to go to film school because I wanted to be a filmmaker. And I made a couple of short films and was just so daunted by the process of collaborating with a crew of people and actors. Oh, yeah. And um, I just found it kind of off-putting where, where I could, you know, lock myself in my bedroom for six months and write and draw a story all by myself. <coughs> and nobody could tell me, you know, boo about it. I guess <laughs> I could do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, I think, like, also, I don't know. This is, like, I'm not going to answer it too deeply, but, like, and this isn't a... Anyways, mm -hmm. when I was in high school, I tried to play football my freshman year in high school, and I hated it because when we lost a game, there was like a thousand different things that could have gone wrong, and I just like couldn't wrap my mind around how to do better as a team mm -hmm. when I had no control over like how to decide to play. I, have, I don't know anything about football, so that was <laughs> the first problem. So then I started running I track. <laughs> so. so then I ran track that same year, and like I killed it at track. I was like state champion at hurdles. Wow. And the reason I think I did so well is because like when I lost a race, there's only one thing that you can do better next time, and that's run faster. Mm -hmm. And it's all on you, and it's not on the team. And so I think that's why I like making comics, because yeah. I could like do everything myself. So you're that person when the coach says, there is no I in team. Like, and you said, but there is me <laughs> the team. And me is leaving the team to do what I want the, to do. I'm a terrible team player. <laughs> like, okay, yeah. so that's great. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, but, you, but you did do a great uh, piece, Bottom Feeders, with, with Ben Passmore. So yeah. How, how was that? Uh, but that was, I think it was also a thing where, like, I, so I have this new book coming out, like, like John said on Fanographic called Bottom Feeders that I wrote and Ben Passmore who did Your Black Friend illustrated. Mm -hmm. And for me that collaborative process was just like, I wrote Bottom Feeders as a film script actually and I was sitting right. on this film script and I didn't know what to do with it and I just fell in love with Ben as a cartoonist and I loved his work and I trusted him enough as an as a artist and creator to just like give him the film script and be like, run with it. Just wow. like, I'm not going to like give you that much direction, just like see what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. And he knocked it out of the park because he's just that talented. And I think like the key for collaboration for me, and, and I've collaborated with a lot of people in the past on multiple projects is to just like, what works for me is to have really clearly delineated uh, like veto structures where like, I'm the writer, I have veto power on this stuff. I'm working with you because you're an artist and right. you have better decision-making process or abilities and like everything that has to do with the art and that's why I'm working with you. Mm -hmm. And so I think like, especially like I have a huge background in doing freelance illustration design. That's how I made my living as my day job for the past 20 years. And like when I'm working with a client and it's just like some business major who's like, I feel like when I look at this, my eye wants to move in this direction because of this, I'm just like, Shut up! Like, exactly. uh, why did you hire me? Like, I'm the right. expert in art here. Oh, believe me, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. How about your eye move right over here? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, David? And I know you've had some ups and downs with collaborate. I mean, you don't have to elaborate, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, how has that been? And, and and you know, or what are your what's your process for dealing with those when you have hiccups in collaboration? I'm just really mean. Okay. You know, I cuss people out, and I yell at them, and I threaten them. Um, and, <laughs> Slash and their tires. Exactly. No, um, I mean, there's a, you know, a lot of it is, um, for me, can you, are you going to create a good book? Okay. That's it. That's the end of the game. And when you write comics, like, you're, you can't be in love with your words. You absolutely can't. Mm -hmm. you, you can be in love with your story. You can be in love with, with, with what you're trying to convey, but it doesn't always come out that way. And you'll get your pages back, and there's, oh, suddenly there's not enough room for the text. Um, and so you got to cut the text. You've got to cut the dialogue. Right. Um, and, and, and the key is, is, well, you want it to be a good read. You know, that's, that's the, the thing. So um, it's always in service to the story. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the collaboration is not easy for me. If, if I could draw, if I could draw well, I wouldn't be working with anybody else. I mean, that's, it, it's, it's, but, and going back to what Ezra was saying about film, it's like, um, to be 100% but to be hundred percent honest, making comics is actually more, the collaborative art of making comics is more difficult than the collaborative art of making films. I've made 
more films and as difficult as they were, they were so much easier, so much smoother, and they were they got done more quickly mm -hmm. than any comic project I've ever done. Um, and I think that is because um, <laughs> artists are crazy. Oh come um, on! Uh, no, I I really I I think that there's. Um, Look, as every artist, I don't care what your art is, whether you're a writer or, or, or you're drawing comics or you're a musician, there's also this level of insecurity. Oh. And, and I think that, that that insecurity can become so overwhelming. And, and it's, um, you know, there's this notion of like, well, I got to get paid. And, and yeah, it's important to get paid. But the key thing is, is that at the end of the day, the work that you're doing, mm -hmm. there really is no, there isn't enough money in the world to pay you. Right. You know, that's it. I mean, like, I can tell you right now that even the worst work that I've ever done, I have not been paid well for it. Okay. My, I work so hard so that even, and I can tell you, like, they're selling some of my books out there right now. And there's, there's at least one of them that's total crap out there. And I will tell you, don't buy that book. Okay. <laughs> and I can tell you later why I think it's crap, but it's still, I didn't get paid enough for all the hard work that I did. Wow. And I think that in, but in film, there's, there's this sort of understanding it, it, it I, it's, I'm still trying to figure out the dynamic of it, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I've met so many comic book artists where, um, you know, there's so many projects I have that aren't done because I've, you know, I've hired somebody, they've done some pages, I've paid them for those pages, and then they just disappear and don't finish the rest. Ghost you. Um, and, and so the thing is, is like, if, if, if you're doing, say, a 100-page graphic novel, or even, just, no, we'll get it down to like a 20-page comic, mm -hmm. and you've got somebody and they've drawn 10 pages and you've given them your hard-earned money, and you cannot track them down to draw those last 10 pages, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's so hard to finish it. But if you're making a film, you can, like if your director of photography acts up, you can fire them and hire a new director of photography. You, your only problem really comes with actors, mm -hmm. if they act up. But you can, and it's just terrible to say, you can trick an actor into finishing, <laughs> right? Or on the fly, you can write rewrite the scene and then the next day show up on set and go, oh, I, I had this great idea and then kill that character off. <laughs> There's so many ways you can fix it. But, but when you're working in comics, it's just usually it's just you and one other person, two other people. So um, I know I'm nuts. I'm sorry. It's, you're all like <laughs> getting ready to leave and get out of here. This but, guy. Um, anyway. All right. At, that said, though, when a collaboration works, I'm working with uh, another writer and an artist on a book that comes out next week. Uh, the, the artist Jamal Campbell is so amazing. Mm -hmm. When I oh, see Naomi. his, yeah, Naomi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from DC, uh, those pages come in, and it's like I he deserves a better writing team than he has. <laughs> this is Jamal, our artist. Wow. You know, um, and and Brian and I talk about this every time we see pages. We're, we are not. It's like we are not worthy of this artist. He's so amazing. I can't wait to, to read it. And, so. And, um, and so that, that, when it works, it feels great, you know. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about this. It was, you know, I had talked, I spoke earlier. Uh, you just men mentioned uh, Brian. It's Brian Michael Bendis, mm -hmm. who is, uh, you know, really well known for the Miles Morales character. and the Jessica of, Jones, Jessica yeah. Jessica Jones, a ton of other things. Um, I was talking about this kind of rise in these characters that are repre that are representing, you know, a wider swath of of the population. You know, that have become super super popular, and also this really kind of interesting uh, underculture of black speculative culture or black speculative art, and not just in uh, comics, but also in film, uh, prose, and also in music. So, so, <coughs> what what, what are y'all's take on? what's happened in that particular piece? Because this has actually been bubbling up, since, I would say for like maybe a decade or so, right? Mm -hmm. And then it kind of, of course, exploded in the mainstream through like black, things like Black Panther and of course into the Spider-Verse and other things. But we've actually already been watching those. Uh, those yeah, a lot of the stuff's happen. been happening, especially in the comics world for 15, 20 years. That's right, yeah. that's right. So what, what do you, th so, so what's happened that you think that these particular, I mean, yeah, have you guys seen like the trailer for like for Fast Color, for instance? Or just, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it looks. I can't wait to see that either. Yeah. It's in March. So, <laughs> well, I think part of it is there. With some people, you you, you can point out something that's missing mm -hmm. or something that's like, you know, 
Like, I'll just use myself as an example, right? I mean, I grew up in an era, I was, you know, I grew up watching James Bond movies. You know, it's, it, we're not going to get into the, how problematic James Bond movies really are because they're really, really problematic. Right. But I grew up watching, like, white male power fantasies and, and only questioning them a little bit and, and usually only questioning them in terms of, well, how come it's not a black guy, right? Um, but I, I seldom really thought about it from a standpoint of well, where, where are the powerful women, that sort of thing. And, um, but then the moment it's pointed out to me, and I'd matured a little bit and gotten a little bit wiser, mm -hmm. suddenly I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like we, now I see there's a problem here, right? I'm aware of it. And it's like now I, I'm bored out of my mind when I watch the white male hero, right? And if I have to write the white male hero, I'm bored out of my mind, right? There's nothing, there's nothing interesting. At 50 years old, I don't find those characters interesting to me anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a writer, I want to challenge myself to create heroes that I find interesting, that I find compelling, right? right? I also want to try to open the door for other creators to do that, but I ain't going to lie, I got to pay rent. Mm -hmm. So if it comes down to me writing that interesting, <laughs> strong female character and getting rent and nobody else making money, I'm cool with that because <laughs> like, cause I got I to gotta pay the bills. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I exactly. also think that there is there. But in, a, in all seriousness, there has to be a, you know, and we talk about this a lot. There, there has to be a certain amount of mentoring. There has to be a certain amount of trying to break the door down. But, you know, and I tell people this all the time when no editor has ever asked me what artist do you want to draw this book? Right. I always give my suggestions. My suggestions are never taken. Mm. And, and, and that's, that's a whole other issue altogether. And, and it, it, just because people don't see the struggle that I'm having behind the scenes of the things that I'm trying to do, the doors that I'm trying to open, the opportunities I'm trying to create, right. doesn't mean that it's not happening. And at some point it will happen. You don't give up on it. Right. So. Right. Um, I don't even remember the question, but <laughs> it sounded awesome. moderately. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's your take on it? Uh, what was the question? The question was dealing <laughs> with this, uh, this, this kind of like um, embracing of oh, black yeah, yeah. culture or like other folk as yeah. as characters uh, who are doing these spectacular things. Yeah. Well, know? I think it's really interesting, and obviously, I love it, and it's definitely opened up doors for me. I think, like, so my personal story is that I've been working on my book Upgrade Soul for fifteen years. And uh, every few years, I'd reach a milestone and pitch it to, to publishers. And as a person who's been making comics, you know, independently for 20 years, mm -hmm. um, I made a lot of connections in comics. I know people at all the major houses, the publishing houses, and I have friends who are editors at these places. And every couple of years, I would pitch Upgrade Soul to my friends and my contacts in the industry, and I would get crickets, mm. always crickets. Really? And Upgrade Soul is a story about an elderly um, mixed race couple. The main character is a black man in his 70s, and his wife is a um, Latina woman who's um, also in her 70s. And it, like the editors would look at it and be just like, no, like, why do we do this? And then it took the success of something like Get Out mm -hmm. for these people to, to suddenly see that there's money to be made in, in diverse stories. And I think it's like this conflux of call out culture where people like don't have a tolerance or patience for the same <coughs> stories and these problematic stories right. over and over and over again. And Hollywood and the gatekeepers seeing that there's money to be made right. uh, in this stuff. So after Get Out came out, my career completely changed because suddenly people are like like oh black horror shit that sells like what do you got and what i'm you like got? Exactly. i've been doing this for 20 years yeah. where have you guys it's been like, where you been exactly yeah. so i think it's been really exciting i think and i think also like i this is something i struggle with as a as a person so my next book bottom feeders uh, stars a black woman and i'm obviously not a black woman and i i also i think this is something that you're getting at too like i'm like, is it okay for me to tell the story of a black woman not being a black woman? And what value does it have for me to at least create representations of, of, of these demographics, even if it's not my own voice? Right. Um, and so that's something that, like, I, I, we're getting to a point where there's, like, a lot of stuff coming out now that stars black female um, protagonists. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that stuff isn't being created by black female creators. And I think there might be a point that I foresee coming up where people are like, we need more black female creators, obviously, and that's obviously yeah. We're the we're we're here right now. I yeah. think it's right. it's and 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 I'm wrestling with that every day. What can I do to right? You know, um, yeah. 
Right. But at the same time, I think like I, I also would get bored by telling stories that are only about the biracial straight male experience. This is my experience. And I think right. there's also room for like, and it's necessary for people that are lucky enough to be in a position of like telling stories and, and communicating with people, it, especially when like we've been given this opportunity because partly because we look the way we look. Like we're straight dudes who like I can walk into a room and pass as a white dude. So I've been given opportunities that a lot of people haven't been given. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I definitely feel like a strong duty to be like, I'm going to take these opportunities that have been given and I'm definitely not going to write stories about white men. I'm going to write stories about people that I don't see enough in media. Right. And hopefully that'll just like make it just more commonplace for people to see that stuff. It's, 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 it's such a difficult struggle because I just, I just turned down a gig the other, like a week ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I told the editor, I said, look, uh, I know three writers who would be amazing for this gig. And all three of them were black women. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and all three of them are published comics writers so it's not like they're they're coming like I can hand work and crickets it was like nothing like they just it was like and the attitude was like well I've never heard of them and I was like and I always say this when someone and this is since there was no response I don't know if that was what they were really thinking but I've heard the I've never heard of them response before yeah and I always say yeah there was a time you never heard of me right we have to take a chance at some point that's right and and it's so infuriating and 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 it's like okay so where do i have to be that where, where what sort of position do i have to be in where i actually have enough juice where i can say hey let's give you know let's give shay grayson a a, a break let's give right. regine sawyer let's give her this gig yes you know and and because it's like regine's been in the trenches forever you know, yeah, and and definitely. so it's created an entire organization around women in comics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spike Trotman. Spike Trotman is more successful than yeah. anybody. Yeah. And she's made more money than all of us collectively in this room together mm -hmm. with her comics. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the, and the interesting <laughs> yeah. thing is, is I I tried to sell or tried to convince Marvel to hire Spike. And then I talked to her about it, and she was like, "Why would I want to work for them? Exactly. I, it would be, it would be, a, I, I'd be making less money." Yeah. But everybody at Marvel was like, "Who?" Yeah. And yeah. I was like, "There's a, there's yeah. a major disconnect." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, That's like, I, I yeah. feel like I, I don't want to try to sound like bitter about comics, because like I do love making comics, <laughs> but I definitely feel like, and like what you just brought up with Spike is like a prime example of why I have no loyalty to comics. Like yeah. comics never showed me love until they saw dollar signs and the stuff I was doing. Yeah. Right. And like the comics industry ignores the success of somebody like Spike Trotman or Raina Telgemeier, who's right. like well, Raina, the exactly. most successful <laughs> comics creator of like, all you, time. How do you not say, I mean, I've heard this like, oh, comics don't sell. I was like, are you reading Raina, are you, yeah. who is Raina yeah. Telgemeier? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'm like that is. Yeah, wrong. but you can drop totally you can you, you can drop her name in meetings at the major comic publishers, and they'll be like, "Who?" Yeah, right. You know, it's like, come it's on. It's mind boggling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't understand it. I mean, I really don't. All right, so I'm gonna um, it's like one last like geeky question, okay. like pseudo geeky question. I'm gonna open it up. <coughs> like, you know, professional geek. I feel like we've been up here for a long time. No, it's almost. We're about to close it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's because the lights. It's like the you know the okay. Ludovico technique. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So so what are you into right now? Pop culture wise, what what's something that you know, that's really like moving you as far? It could be film, it could be video games, it could be whatever. Like, what is what's the thing that's kind of like, yeah, I'm really digging that right now, or or something that you're looking forward to engaging with right now? It could be anything. Um. Like, I well, I just know I just got Rebecca's book. Um, the what's uh, I can't remember the title of it now. Trail of Trail of Light. Tra Trail of Light, and I just got that. I was really into. And I got one of um, Daniel Jose Older's books, and like those, both of both of them really sort of reinvigorated the creative spark. Being here this weekend has reinvigor reinvigorated the creative spark. But I know there's stuff that you got going on mm. um, that I'm like really excited to see come out. Well, yeah. And um, and then with Bottom <laughs> Feeder, I want to see that too. So, it's really, um, it's really good. but I'm so caught up in the creative, creating my own stuff right now that it's it's difficult for me to. Um, I don't have a lot of time. Like I'm no, still no. getting trying to get caught up on on what else is out there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I want to see what's at the at the at, Tomorrow, what what other creators what have brought? Are, what, yeah, what people are doing. Yeah, yeah. What about you guys? Any anything that's uh? Well, I'm obviously really excited about us. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited yeah. about that. Come on, us or 
I mean, yes, past, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you mean the you mean or do you mean the Jordan Peele? Yeah, film? the new Jordan Peele. Yeah, exactly. That new Jordan Peele joint. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got five on it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I tend to consume media that's related to projects I'm working on. So I'm working on a like yeah. a swamp noir crime story right now. Hey, swamp, swamp noir. noir. Okay, we have to talk about that. <laughs> that's and, really dope. Uh, so I'm like looking at a lot of like crime mysteries. Actually, one of my inspirations for this book, how I imagine it being done, is. Um, the graphic novel adaptation of uh, Daddy Cool. Oh, yeah. oh by yeah. Alfredo Alcala and yeah. Don. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, that's stuff. amazing. Yeah. Actually, so I, I imagine a, like that form factor being. There's a really great um, piece in you know our book, um, The Black of the Ink, that's on that mm. on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. Yeah. So I'm watching Send a lot of TV shows, listening to music. Okay. To get in that swamp mindset. Swamp mindset. You got to get in it, man. Some Joe R. Lansdale. Have you, like... Uh, no, I'm the, not oh, that on the list. Yeah, check out, like, his, his Hap and Leonard books, because they're that's oh, sort okay. of like a oh, that's right. southern oh, yeah, yeah. fried okay, yeah. swamps and gators and yeah. all that fun stuff. All right. So any, uh, any questions for these gentlemen? Oh, first you Yes, ma'am. Like peak blackness. That's a great question. Well, here's the thing. If you have a story to tell, there's nobody stopping you from telling it other than yourself, right? I, it sounds sort of dismissive, but it's like, if you want to write a book, write the book. It, it's like my first published novel was rejected by every single publisher. No, no lie. Every single publisher in North America rejected my book. So what did I do? I published it myself. I got more work because I published it myself. I've been self-publishing for nearly 30 years at this point in my career, right? And I'm going back to self-publishing this year because I'm so tired of established publishers saying, yeah, we don't think this is gonna sell. Right. It's like, well, you can't sell it, but I'm gonna be able to sell it and I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Ezra's book, Upgrade Soul, it wasn't like he was nobody who hadn't done anything. Like, Upgrade Soul was like a dope book. For years, it was a dope book. For 15 years, he worked on it. And it, like, I would see him, and he was like, yeah, no, nothing. You know? and, and even after you won the, the um, I mean, there was, there was interest after the McDuffie Award, but it was, you were still looking for a publisher, right? And, and so the thing is, is it sounds really, people think I'm being dismissive when I say just, just do it, right? Your first book will not be, or your first comic or your first, first film is not going to be your greatest work. If it is, you're in trouble, okay? <laughs> but if you're waiting for somebody to give you permission or to, or, or, to, or, or to open the door for you and go, hello, welcome to Marvel, right? The moment they let you in that room, you're already looking for the exit. You know, it's like, it's not as great as one might think it is. And, and it comes with a lot of rules. And, you know, I, I've had people tell me, oh, well, I got this great idea for the X-Men. And I'm like, okay. And then they tell me, I'm like, you know they're never going to let you do that. And, <laughs> and they're like, no, no, they'll let me do it. And I'm like, yeah, I know seven people who had that exact same idea. And I've been in the room with five of those people and they've said, no, you don't get to do that idea, right? So the key thing is, is to create no matter what and to, and, and to build your audience. I mean... I'm, I've worked for Marvel, I've worked for DC, and I've, I've watched my books not sell. I've watched them get good critical response, but I've watched them do just poorly enough for editors to not return my phone calls. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and so there's a lot of people that might look at me in this position and go, oh, he's got it made. And it's like, I'm sitting there going, man, I hope I sell some books this weekend because rent is almost due. And, and that's the reality of it. It's not stopping me from creating stuff, but it's it's forcing me to look at other avenues, other ways to create and to never stop and go, oh man, if they just would give me a break, mm -hmm. I just create my own breaks, you know? And that's the thing we always have to do. We always have to create our own breaks. Right. 
I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> 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 That's a David question. Because we haven't, have you, have you been from our um, No. No, no. Me either. No. So, yeah, that's you. What, what the hell? The oh. library. Oh, okay. Oh. Wrap it up. Okay. We can do that. We're getting there. Okay, yeah, we're getting there. Okay. Okay, so the main challenge is this um, the comics industry, and by the industry, I mean the publishers, and I mean the retailers and I mean even the journalists who write about it, there's not a lot of them. It's a very small pond with some very big fish and it's running out of food. And um, uh, it's, it's, so you go to the indie publishers and everybody's fighting for shelf space, they're fighting for attention, and they're fighting to make the bottom line, which is money. And the key is, is if you want to make comics and you want to make money and you want to survive, either you need to get another job or you need to redefine how much money you want to make and you have to be willing to go to conventions and you shouldn't be trying to get published by somebody else because you're not really going to make money at these publishers. I mean, that's the harsh truth. The harsh truth is that with the exception of Marvel and DC, most of them pay very low page rates. If you've created something that is your own, most of them want to own a such a big piece of it that if it were turned into a film or television show, you probably wouldn't get that much money off of that. But they're also controlling who they're negotiating with. Mm. And so, you know, you you've written this great book and it's got this incredible person of color, you know, this, this trans gender, you know, person of color. And then by the time Hollywood gets it, it's, you know, it's Tom Cruise playing that character. <laughs> and, and you have no control over that, right? And so, um, but again, there's someone like Spike Trotman. Right. Spike Wonderful. is living by her own rules and she's making money. And, but if you go into most bookstores and you go into most comic stores, they don't have her work there. They don't have her, the, the, her company, Iron Circus. They, don't, they might not even have any books by, by, by Spike's publishing company, but she's found success. Right. And, and the key thing is that each of us has to define success on our own terms. And if you're looking at whether it's a Marvel or a DC or some of these other publishers and going, success is gonna be working for these companies, that's not necessarily the case. And what if it is, what if it doesn't work out that way? What if, you know, what if, let's say hypothetically, all your life you wanted to write Luke Cage, you know, and you had this great idea for a Luke Cage comic, and then you get to write Luke Cage for Marvel, and every idea they tell you, they reject, okay? And they say, no, the readers won't want this, or the readers don't care about this, and this is what you have to do, and you get the shit beat out of you so bad that after a while, you just, you realize you're either going to have to quit the book, or you're going to have to write what they want. And then you write what they want, and then the book sells terrible, and then it gets canceled, and everybody's like, yeah, the book wasn't that good. They didn't listen to you about who the artist was to choose. They didn't listen to you about what would be a good story. They didn't listen to you when you said people really care about the fact that Luke has a wife and a daughter, okay? And so all that shit doesn't make it into the book, and then the book is terrible, and then it doesn't sell. Then what do you do? You just go, okay, well, I had my shot at my dream, and I shit the, the, the dream shit the bed. You say it. I don't say that because that's not what I'm saying. We're not talking about me right now. Um, um, Are you sure? And then, but then you also go, but this was just one little thing. Right. And I have these other things over here because, because you didn't tie all of your dreams and hopes and aspirations and your self-worth into this childhood dream. You also have this project over here. You also have this book that, that while you're, you're watching your childhood dream go down the toilet, you've got this thing that you're laboring on that nobody even knows you're working on. And then two years later it comes out and they're like, oh, I didn't know, you know, and, and all the people who, who read your Luke Cage book and said it was terrible are never gonna pick up your Frederick Douglass book. Mm. And, and, but the thing is, is, is that your Frederick Douglass <laughs> book, hypothetically, is gonna, is gonna stay in print for the next 20 years, right. 30 years. Yep. And it's gonna inspire young people to become historians. 
I love it. Or, or abolitionist, because slavery still exists. Mm -hmm. So, all right. you know, well, so. Well. <laughs> but well, so, yeah, that's it. It's all about, you know. I, I think we're going to, I think we're going to shut it down. <laughs> yeah, they're going to kick us out eventually. Okay, yeah. So, uh, thank you so much, Ezra. Thank David, you. David, thank you all so much. Thanks thank you all. Thank you. Exactly. That's wonderful. All right.